Hello. This video is part of my submission to Handmade Network Learning Jam. It's a new kind of jam that happens on two weekends. And the principle is that the first weekend you choose a topic and you try to learn as much as you can about it. And the second weekend you try to uh, explain everyone else uh, about what you just learned. So I chose the topic of colors. Uh, I didn't really know uh, knew anything about colors besides that you can create colors by mixing red, green, and blue lights. And I had heard some terms like uh, gamma, sRGB, and HSV, and things like that, but I never really had the opportunity to dig into uh, what they mean and how they can be applied to programming. So this was a good opportunity. And for the restitution part of it, I figured it would be more in the spirit of the jam to just record a video uh, where I do kind of an ad lib and I explain what I've learned and maybe code a little bit to uh, generate figures uh, rather than like making a more formal uh, blog post. So bear with me uh, and we will be talking about colors. So maybe we can try by uh, discussing a little bit about how we perceive colors. Uh, so in our eyes, we have um, cone cells um, that are responsible for our perception of color. And we actually have three kinds of cone cells and uh, each kind react differently to different wavelengths of light. So if I want to draw like a spectral response of a group of cone cells, um, it will look like a plot like this, where I have my wavelength here, that would be nanometers. And I have some kind of activation level for my cone cells. And uh, for a given group of cone cells, the response would be something like this. So this means that if I have a monochromatic light uh, with a wavelength which is like here, it will activate my cone cells a lot. But if I have um, a, a monochromatic light um, more like here, my cone cells won't be as much activated. So if I'm drawing the, the other groups of cone cells on the same plot, it will give me something like this. here. So the three different kind of cone cells um, uh, react to uh, roughly um, short wavelengths, middle wavelengths, and long wavelengths. And their peaks are uh, at wavelengths that correspond roughly to uh, blue, green, and red. Um, so for example, if I have an incoming light that has some spectrum, that looks like uh, this. Um, this spectrum would be integrated uh, with the spectral responses of each kind of cone cell. Uh, and it will give me basically three signals. Uh, so like a very little signal for the blue group of cone cells and uh, approximately equal signals for the red and green. Uh, cone cells, and my brains will interpret these three signals as uh, the color orange. So the thing we, we can notice here is that the spectral responses for these different kind of cone cells are um, quite large and they also overlap. So one uh, consequence of that is that if I have another uh, spectrum that looks more like, I don't know, like this, um, you see that this spectrum might actually activate my different group of cone cell in the same way that the, the previous spectrum and thus it would be uh, interpreted as the same color by my brain. So the point is different uh, lights with different spectrums can be interpreted as the same color um, because of these, uh, of these overlaps. Another thing we can, um, we can point to is that if I have three 
um, monochromatic uh, lights, uh, one that is red, one that is uh, blue, and one that is green, like this. They will activate um, primarily one group of cone cell and not the two other ones. So by varying the intensity of um, red, green, and blue lights, um, I can hope to recreate an arbitrary um, uh, mix of the three signals, and so I can hope to match like an arbitrary color. Um, so that's how our uh, computer displays work. Um, I can pass some uh, RGB value um, to uh, some pixel on my screen, and this will vary the intensity of red, green, and blue subpixel inside uh, inside a pixel. So here, red, green, and blue. And so the um, the pixel uh, will will, uh, will uh, look like the mix of the different intensity of each of these uh, subpixel, and this will create a color like uh, like the orange I was talking about. Um, so now the important thing to notice is that uh, if I just have these three values, the actual color I get uh, from these values depends on the actual wavelength of each of these uh, subpixels. And it also depends on the activation response um, of these sub subpixels. So if I display the exact same uh, values on a different screen, for example, uh, I might have uh, slightly different wavelengths for the subpixel, and the value could look um, something completely different. Uh, furthermore, if I want to print um, the same color to paper, uh, I would probably use uh, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black ink on paper. So that would be a completely different set of primaries. So how can I map this RGB value to the CMYK value that my printer would use and get the same color? So this this question uh, is called uh, color matching. So how to ensure that some color can be transported from one device to the other? And if you just have the, uh, the the triplet of values here, it doesn't really give you any meaningful way of talking about a color. What you want to have is what you call a color space, which is a way to map these triplets to some absolute space where one point unambiguously uh, represents uh, one color. And you want to uh, know how you can match um, uh, this color with uh, different kind of primary colors. So that leads us to an interesting experiment they did in uh, 1931, uh, done by the CIE. Uh, um, and the experiment goes like this. So I will separate my uh, field of vision into two parts. And on the test uh, side, I have some monochromatic lights, uh, which I know the, the wavelength of, and I uh, will project like a colored spot on a white screen. And on the other side, I have three primaries whose wavelengths is, are also uh, known. So I have a red primary light, a green primary light, and a blue primary light. And I ask um, subjects to vary the intensity of each of these primary lights to try to match the test light. So in this case, it would probably be something like uh, a large amount of uh, red light and some amount of green light and very little blue, if any, uh, to get to match the um, orange light here. And 
So what they do next is that uh, they, they vary the wavelength of the test light uh, from like 380 to 750 nanometers to cover the whole visible uh, spectrum in some um, regular increments. And for each wavelength, you uh, put in table the intensities that the users uh, set for each of the primaries. And what this gives you is um, what is called uh, color matching functions. And that tells you how much of the three primaries you need to match a given um, monochromatic uh, light. Uh, and so in some cases, um, some of the test lights are not uh, matchable with the three primaries uh, that are chosen. So in this case, what they do is that they would mix some primary color into the test light to make the match achievable. And the primary light you had, you add on the um, test side, you can put it in the table as negative light you would add on the, um, on the observer side. Uh, so that will give you some uh, color matching functions that look like this. Uh, again, I have my wavelength here. And here I have the intensities of the primaries and the color matching function uh, for each of those primaries will be something like this. It can go in the negative and in the positive. And it will look something like this. So the first thing I would want to do is to actually uh, plot these um, color matching functions uh, using um, experimental uh, data from this, this experiment. Um, so let me um, get some Python pi here. And just to uh, give you an idea of what these experimental uh, data uh, look like, I have this here. So it's CIE RGB color matching functions. So it's just a CSV file where the first column is the um, wavelength uh, of the test light, and the three other columns are the intensities for the red, green, and blue primaries. So first thing I want to do is to load this file. So I will import CSV. Uh, I will open the file. Um, CIE RGB CMF dot CSV in reading mode. And I will create a reader. Um, and this contains a floating point value, so I guess I have to do something like uh, quoting false CSV quote non numeric. Um, and I will extract the rows of this CSV file by uh, taking a list from the reader. And then I can close the file. Um, and what I would actually want is like the transpose of this uh, because I want to have column for each uh, wavelength. So let me import NumPy. Um, so columns equal MP transpose. 
of rows and so the first column will be so um, lambda but lambda is, is a keyword so maybe I'll get, um, just get web length so that should be if I can type that should be uh, columns one um, and we will have red which is columns one, columns two, and columns three. And I can um, try to plot that. So So I will plot the red against the wavelength with the color red. Green and blue. And then I can show that so probably won't work on the first try. Uh, coding CSV reader. Um, at least, uh, oh yeah, I have to pass the file, obviously. Okay, what I'm doing here is that uh, it is, comp uh, yeah, I, I'm a little bit stupid because I'm not used to uh, record while coding. So this should look more correct. So here we are. We have our um, different activation um, or um, sorry, it's not activation levels for cone cells. It's rather it's matching functions for a set of chosen primaries. And that, that was the thing that I got confused about um, the first time I, I uh, learned about these things. Is like, I thought this was like um, activation uh, functions and I was wondering what what the heck is happening? Why, why does your, um, how can your cells be negatively um, activated? And so bear in mind, th these are not activation functions for the actual cone cells in our eye. These are matching functions uh, for a chosen set of primaries. And if you chose a different set of primaries, you would get different um, uh, matching functions. And actually, we, we will uh, talk about that in, in a moment. So uh, now the uh, actual, like the absolute values of um, the R, G, and B intensities uh, of these color matching function depends on the intensity of the um, of the test light, and so what we're more interested in is the proportion of red, green, and blue uh, we need in the final color to get a match. So what I can do is I can divide um, each of these values by the sum of all three. And B, and I actually don't need to compute B because um, since I'm dividing by the sum of all three, I know that the, the sum of the normalized R, G, and B is always equal to one. So B is all is um, actually equal to one minus R minus G. And now I want to plot these uh, in 3D to see where all my monochromatic uh, lights uh, end up in this 3D space. So let's um, add some figure and I'll add some subplots. Uh, and the projection should be 3D. 
Um, and then I guess I can just plug these and show this. Uh, figure object as no add, add subplot. Did you mean add subplot way down in this course? Okay, so here I have um, what's called the spectral loci, which is like the the set of points where all uh, all monochromatic lights um, uh, end up in this three D space, and what I can do to make this a little more um, understandable is that, so I normalized uh, each of the components by the sum of all three. Uh, the important thing to, um, to understand is that actually the, 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 the colors, um, the, the, yeah, the spectrum of colors you, your eye can see, um, actually uh, lies in a cone, which uh, extends from the origin to that outer rim. So I can plot this, like make this more obvious by just uh, plotting a little bit of, um, like plotting this, this thing, but multiplying by some, um, coefficients, uh, so for um, for some coefficient a in some linear space, and I will go from 0 to, to 1 in uh, 10 steps, I can plot a times r, a times g, a times b, and show that, and I always set color to blue, so we don't have like a uh, confusing colors. Okay, so you can see that that kind of cone that extends um, from from zero uh, intensity on all primaries, and the the outer rim of that cone is um, monochromatic light. And the points on the interior of that cone can always be uh, created by mixing lights that are, um, that are monochromatic. Uh, so they're always like a linear combination of the colors that lies on the rim. And so, the, the way you will see that represented uh, more often is by just projecting that on a plane. Um, but I found that it was a little bit confusing because the illustration you will see are in 2D, but uh, it's important to, to keep in mind that these uh, color space are really 3D. But if I want to reproduce the figure that you can see on Wikipedia articles and things like that, um, I just have to say that um, since B can be recreated from R and G, uh, I can just like project everything on the RG plane. So for example, um, I can just plot RG. And so that looks more like something you will see uh, where you have uh, R here and G here, and, and you can see the spectral loci, but projected onto the RG plane. Um, what we can do is try to color the inside of that um, diagram to get what is called a chromaticity diagram. Um, so, to do that, I will have to um, create a grid on which I can map uh, some uh, some colors. So 
I will create a mesh grid uh, on some linear space. So actually, let me see what are the extents of this figure again. So it goes from uh, minus one five to one, and from minus oh one to two or something. So we'll go from minus one five to one in hundred steps, or let's say five hundred steps, and to um, minus oh one to two, and this will give us our mesh grid, and then we will want to map our mesh grid, to map a function on our mesh grid uh, that will be um, um, RGB from RG. Uh, right here. So I get my R from R, my G from G, and my B is one minus R minus G. And um, so I, I, as I said, we are projecting like the whole space onto some plane, and so we can kind of choose how we want to um, to do that projection to represent, um, to, to select a color for each point, because actually each point on that RG diagram um, corresponds to an infinity of colors, like to a, whole, um, to a whole line that goes from the origin to the infinity. Uh, and so we have to apply some kind of normalization to choose which, which color on that line we want to display. And uh, and you can see different choices uh, in different illustrations uh, on the internet. Um, one that we can have is if we want to display colors with the maximum um, uh, value, we can just uh, normalize that by the maximum of all three components. So that will be a maximum of R, G, and B. And I have to return. Um, I have to return colors, so I I have to like stack these three uh, colors um, and divided by my normalization factor. So no, I can map this function over my mesh grid and I can show um, this and I have to pass the extent which is uh, so we said minus one five one minus o one and two so let's see what it looks like, and it looks like it's wrong, it's reversed. Um, so I guess. So basically, I never uh, remember um, what the billion uh, parameters for pipelet functions are. So image show takes the image, the norm aspect, alpha, and yeah. So the origin parameter might be what we want because it's displaying with the origin on the top left. Um, and yeah, and uh, of course we have to pass this origin set to lower. And that should look like more something more correct. Okay, so now the thing is, um, all the colors we can see 
are colors that can be made from these um, from like a linear combination of um, monochromatic lights. So actually, the lights we can see are all inside that spectral loci, and the colors that we see outside are just um, imaginary colors that don't make real uh, physical sense. So I might want to clip that to the spectral loci just to get some um, more some uh, figures that's more similar to what you will find on the internet. And so to do that, um, I guess I have to create a polygon from um, from my um, spectral loci. So from Matplotlib. I'll import patches. Uh, I'll make a polygon. Which is that? Which is polygon? Um, And it takes x, y, which are the vertices of the polygon, and um, uh, and it's n by two array. So I will have to transpose my um, R G again. Um, and then I have to clip, um, well, first I want to display that, maybe. So if I take big figure and AX equal uh, GCA, and I want to add this patch. And now I can clip this image to the polygon. Uh, and I guess I can just eat that. So figure is not defined. That's right. Uh, well, maximum dimension for and and the array uh, transpose axis. Oh yes, I have to grab that in the list. Okay, so that means I'm just uh, guess I have to. Set something so that the that thing isn't filled. So alpha and animated until we have clip patch of the uh, face color figure fill. Maybe that's it. Uh, fill equal false. And sure enough, you get your um, uh, what's called an RG um, chromaticity diagram, which shows the spectral loci and the chromaticities inside that loci. And so, like the chromaticity is basically the component of color that doesn't depends on the um, on the brightness. Um, so you get all the chromatidicities inside uh, what's called the gamut um, of the human eye, which is so all the chromatidicities that can be uh, perceived by our eyes. And um, another important thing to, to point out is that um, we have seen that some of the colors um, in that gamut are not um, 
possible to match with RGB lights. So actually on my screen and on your screen, a lot of these colors um, are actually just clipped by the, um, by the, by the screen. And these are not like the real chromatices that we would want, but these are just not representable with red, green, and blue lights. We can see actually that um, we have our blue uh, primary here at the origin. We have a red primary at 0, 1, and we have a green primary at, um, zero, at, uh, at 0, 1. And all the colors that the screen can actually represents faithfully uh, are in this triangle. And so all the, the colors outside cannot be represented faithfully on a monitor uh, on a computer display. So these are just clipped to some colors that is close enough. Um, but these are colors that, like the, the, the colors for these coordinates do exist. Um, on the contrary, colors that are outside uh, the spectral loci are just um, imaginary colors. So where do we go from here? Um, there are two drawbacks with these uh, RGB uh, color matching functions. Uh, so one first drawback is that at the time, so 1931, all the computations were done by hand and with um, uh, calculus rulers. And it wasn't very practical to add these functions with negative values. Uh, one other thing is that this RGB space uh, is not well organized with regard to the perceived brightness of the color. And so one question when we can ask is like what the, um, what the um, average response of all these um, groups uh, of, of cone cells um, what is the perceived brightness um, of different uh, wavelengths of, uh, of monochromatic lights? So if I draw again um, all my wavelengths, and here I will have some assessment of, uh, of uh, brightness. And the way they did the experiment is they presented uh, pairs of light with different wavelengths and, and they ask subjects to adjust the intensity of each light to match the brightness. Um, and you will get something like, um, like a curve like that. And they noticed that it's actually very close to the green uh, color matching function. Um, so there was the desire to choose another set of primaries uh, for which you would have um, color matching functions where all the values are positive and the second matching function uh, actually corresponds to the curve of uh, perceived brightness. Um, so so basically, we want to, to choose uh, three different primaries where all visible colors are, um, are a linear combination of these primaries with only positive coefficients. And if we look at our uh, chromaticity diagram again, this would mean that all these uh, colors fit inside a triangle. So we can immediately see that um, if we want to, to have all of this in a triangle, we have to choose primaries that are um, actually imaginary colors. Um, so let me draw this very quickly. Uh, we have actually our zero, that's something like here. So we want uh, all of that uh, gamut to, to fit in a triangle. And so the vertices of that triangle, which are our new primaries, are actually imaginary colors. 
But that, that allows us, by choosing carefully these primaries, to get the properties we want, which is that each uh, color is, um, is a linear combination with only positive coefficients, and that the um, second uh, component will match the perceived brightness of the color. So um, changing the primaries is equivalent to uh, making a change of basis. So we will just like multiply our RGB values with a matrix to change from our original primaries, which are, are uh, blue, red, and green here, to new primaries, which will be called CR, uh, CG, and CB. And the actual matrix for that, um, I get values conveniently written down here. So what I will do is just uh, make that matrix um, as an NP array. And um, then, uh, well, that will be confusing. This M, so I will just call that um, um, RGB to X, Y, Z. And so my new uh, my new space, which is not RGB, but which which will be called X, Y, Z. Um, will be like just transformation of my RGB space uh, by that matrix. So I guess it's um, matmol of the RGB. Oops, typo here. To X Y Z and with my RGB components. And uh, then I can do the same uh, thing uh, where I will normalize that XYZ. So let me say X equal XYZ zero. And little x will be x over x plus y plus z. And z equal 1 minus x minus y. And I will do the same, uh, the same can of um, of uh, projection, uh, where I will just project everything on the x, y uh, plane and uh, forget about the z, which I can reconstruct. Um, so this will go something like uh, this. Let me just plot that to to check it's correct, so x, y, and just show that at first. Uh, y is not defined, did you mean no y? Of course, here. Um, so that's our new uh, that's our new spectral loci in the X Y Z in the X Y plane, uh, and so you see that um, it's all actually contained in the triangle of all primaries, which are at zero zero uh, zero one 
uh, like uh, one zero and zero one. And so I, I will try to do the same kind of coloring now. So I have another mesh grid. Here, but now the linear space can go from zero to one on each dimension. Uh, and my new function, which will be RGB from XY. So I get x from x, y from y, and z equal 1 minus x minus y. And I will convert that to, um, to RGB. So I guess uh, what I can just do is invert uh, the matrix. Uh, so I'm lean elk uh, inverse of my matrix uh, RGB to XYZ. And I will um, say, okay, RGB equal um, MP matmol of T by XY. Oh, but um, the thing is, okay, so the thing is, the, the way NumPy works, these will be, like the way mesh grid work will be these X and Y will be like 500 by 500 grids. And so I don't know how to broadcast that with the matrix multiplication. So, so let me actually do this by hand because I don't uh, really want to. Um, to try to coerce NumPy into doing the right thing. So I'm just doing the matrix multiplication by hand. If I can type for once, um, so R and the G and the B and one two zero one two and zero one two. Here, of course, this should be green and blue, and I have the same kind of normalization I can do, which is that. I will take the maximum of, let me just copy that, and send the stacked component to make color. I will show that, so let me do the same clipping thing. Um, I make a polygon from my XY patches. Uh, add that polygon. No, I want to see. Yeah, I want to create a color from my mesh grid. So RGB from XYZ from XY and pass the mesh grid. Um, okay, and no, I can set that. But this time the extents would be 0, 1. Zero one, and 
and I guess Uh, NumPy lin elk has no argument inverse, so what is it supposed to be called? Um, uh, NumPy metric inverse. So it's called inf for whatever reason. Where am I? Uh, here. Very good naming convention. RGB two X Y Z is not defined. Um, yes. So here is our uh, chromaticity diagram, but this time on the XY plane uh, instead of the RG plane. So um, one thing that confused me at first was that uh, if you look for this kind of illustration on uh, the internet, for example, on Wikipedia, if you search for chromaticity, diagram, you will uh, find some things like that. And so some of them look more like four colors and some some other look more like uh, the colors I have been like blurred into each other. And it just depends on the um, on the um, normalization you choose for uh, your colors. Uh, so here I chose to normalize by the maximum of all three components, but I could also have chosen some other norm. And um, so, for example, I can say m equal power of r uh, five plus or g5 by choosing an arbitrary norm and taking the root um, the fifth root of that And you will see that we have something that looks more like the, the figures we have here. Uh, so it's just a matter of choosing the norm you apply to, uh, to the values to get some color, um, like to choose some color um, along that infinite line that goes from the origin and extends to infinity inside that, that cone. So it's just, just a reminder that uh, these diagrams are actually like a projection of a whole 3D space onto a plane, uh, but the actual uh, XYZ uh, color space is a 3D space. So at this point, you might be wondering uh, why the heck do we care about uh, the XYZ space? Does it have any practical value? Uh, doesn't seem very intuitive to build and it doesn't seem to make a whole lot of uh, physical sense because uh, uh, remember the primaries we chose to define that space are actually imaginary lights that can be produced from combining um, uh, monochromatic lights so they, they don't really make any kind of physical sense but the answer to that is that since the CIE committee specifies the matching uh, functions for these primaries and also like the um, the observing conditions um, under which these uh, color matching function can be applied. This means that each point in that space unambiguously um, uh, defines a color um, independent of the way you will reproduce that color on different types of media. So, um, if I have a color on my screen, knowing the, um, 
the wavelength for the R, G, and V subpixels in my screen on their intensity response. I can map that color into an absolute color space like the XYZ space. And then I can map that to another space like using uh, different RGB primaries or just dif different primaries like uh, CMYK inks to print that color and paper. And I can actually preserve um, the color across these changes of space and these changes of media. So uh, this is why the absolute color spaces like that are interesting. And the CIE defines a number of other absolute uh, color space that have different properties, like some are more aligned uh, to um, how our eyes perceive colors. Um, there are also other um, absolute color spaces uh, like the Adobe RGB or uh, Microsoft's sRGB color spaces. And um, this all allows to talk about color unambiguously and serve as reference points um, to uh, preserve colors uh, across changes of media and changes of uh, primary colors. So that's the that's value um, of these. Um, and next video, we will see uh, some uh, color spaces that are uh, more practical that you can directly use when programming. And we will talk a little bit about how our screen um, actually maps uh, RGB value. We, we, we give them to um, an intensity for each R, G, and B uh, subpixels. Um, and we will talk about different ways of representing uh, RGB, um, like uh, re like separating the, the concept of hue and uh, saturation and value, and talking about colors in a more um, in a more intuitive uh, way, uh, say for an artist, for example, that wouldn't want to directly um, um, manipulate uh, RGB numbers but would want something that's more aligned to mixing colors, uh, uh, mixing paints on a canvas. Uh, so that will be for the next video. Until then, goodbye.